Our next presenter is Tom Price. Uh, Tom Price is Catholic Relief Services Senior Communications Manager. He's worked in communications with international relief and development agencies for over 16 years. His work has involved both communication strategy and management at headquarters level, as well as travel to de the developing world to write, photograph, and video the work of Catholic Relief Services and Habitat hum for Humanity International. Nobody's heard of Habitat, I'm sure. Uh, Tom has visited more than 50 countries and has served at major humanitarian emergencies in Africa, Asia, the Balkans, and most recently in Haiti. His writing and interviews have appeared in national and international media, from the Los Angeles Times to CNN and the BBC. Please join me in welcoming Tom Price. morning or almost afternoon and um, the media and humanitarian um, disasters I mean the one thing you can probably say for sure is that the local brewery is going to do well out of it if there is one um, other than that this is a collection of thoughts of myself over the past 16 years very limited academic study on this I mean I have had plenty of notice I trolled around basically two major pieces, one that CRS was involved in, which I'll reference later, and another bit of work from, from Stanford. So a lot of it you can challenge, please do. If I'm not making any sense, stop me. Because a lot of it is just based on what I think, what's happened in my experience. And like they said at the intro, I think the, uh, the first humanitarian disaster I turned up with was just after Rwanda. The most recent was Haiti. Um, I was involved in the Balkans conflicts and Kosovo when Mark was out there, um, the tsunami as well. So I've seen a lot of them. I've seen a lot where the media has been and where they haven't. Um, this is, um, do you recognize that, Mark? That's um, Stankovac in Macedonia, which is the big refugee camp that um, the Albanian refugees came over into, and that was an absolute media circus. But we've had others where, you know, you're begging the media and they don't come along. But essentially, the relationship between uh, NGOs and the media is a very uneasy partnership. Um, we need each other, though. Um, we, we provide them with news. I mean, even just the other day with, with Sandy, um, in Cuba and Jamaica and Haiti. We're getting a lot of calls. What's happening? What's going on? What's the impact? And what they really want is to get someone on the other end of the line who will paint a picture verbally about what they're seeing and what the impact on the average person in Haiti or Cuba is. And the media is hugely dependent upon NGOs for that. Um, we need them for the publicity, especially for a big emergency. Um, we can't rely on public funds. We need to get out there to private individuals, and that's you know that's where the donations come from. Okay, um, there's mutual admiration in the work of um, NGOs by the media, but like I say, the suspicion as well. And it's not always, I would say, that the NGO is the the little bird caught in the media mouth. Um, I was involved with the Sudan famine in 1999. Um, most of the operations from there were based um, just over the border in Kenya, a huge place called Lokichokyo, which most of you have probably never heard of, but it's an enormous operation in northern Kenya. There was a team from an international news agency there that I was talking to at the bar. Yeah, it's that big, they have a bar, but all the beers are warm. <laughs> um, and I was saying, you know, come in with us. Let's see this stuff, you know, let's tell you the story about what's happening in um, Bara Ghazal. Um, they were, you know, they're playing the game, they talk to me, they talk to Save the Children, they'll talk to Oxfam. In the end, because of the schedule, they went in with, with us. When they got there, they actually saw the conditions, they realized there was no Avis to rent a car to go back. And just how bare it is in that part of Sudan, it had changed from this to please don't leave me. You know, they, they were just so clingy, so dependent. So it's, it's almost a symbiotic relationship. We really do need each other. Okay, this is the study from um, Colby College, which I believe is in Maine. 
And they reached out to us after the tsunami, and they did a large study which involved, I think, 10 major US NGOs. One additional minute of TV coverage on a national network, and you're going to see an over 13% increase in donations to the average big NGO. Even larger with a 700-word article in a big national paper like the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. So media coverage drives funding for humanitarian emergencies. Simple as that. It's proved. Okay. Now for us, in terms of funding, and this is not in terms of commitment to personnel, but of in funding, etc. These are the five largest emergencies since 1985 for CRS. The Asian tsunami at the top, private donations over 170 million, Haiti just behind that at over 150, then Ethiopia, the Ethiopia famine, Bob Geldof, Live Aid, all that. If you're old enough, if you're over 40, you remember that. That's when I decided I wanted to work for a humanitarian agency. I wanted to be like, I wanted to be like Bob Geldof. And <laughs> um, the Balkans conflict, and then Hurricane Mitch, which someone mentioned before. Okay, um, we can't run a large marketing strategy. Um, we can't get into people's front rooms in the evening, so we need the media to do that. And it's when you get one of these big um, emergencies, we, as uh, Mark Melia, who heads up fundraising for us, says you can ride the wave in terms of donations coming in. Okay, but also, you know, this is a bit of a, uh, doesn't really make sense in a way. Because you can see under Haiti there, we got 2.7 million in 2011 alone on Haiti. And that's when we weren't going out and saying, we need your money. We were accepting the money because we can certainly spend it over our five year period there. But you know, there were other emergencies going on. Also for Japan, we didn't even launch an appeal. And we got over five million in. Yes, we've used the money, it's gone on to Caritas Japan and some others, but you know, we, we, we weren't pushing it out there. It was driven by the media in that case. So, you know, is, is the tail wagging the dog there? Okay. Then you get emergencies and you get that type of situation. You know, if the media's not there, <laughs> no one knows about it. Um, Media-driven emergencies, um, they overshadow chronic protracted conditions like malaria, HIV, and unheralded humanitarian emergencies. The media are not there. There's little relationship between what donors give and how many people need help. There's a crisis mentality, a deluge of generosity following headline cal uh, calamities, but there are many emergencies where you know, no one's listening. The media are not there. I think that Jack mentioned this before. Um, I think less than six months after the Haiti earthquake, there was enormous flooding in Pakistan. Uh, 20 million people affected. A fifth of the country was underwater. Uh, Ban Ki-moon called it the worst disaster he'd ever seen. The total economic damage to the country was over 43 billion. CRS raised, uh, can anyone take a guess what we'd raised? And we were going out aggressively on this, considering we raised 150 million for Haiti before. You don't want to take a stab at it? 10. Sorry. 75 million. 3.9 million. Hmm. Oh. So I'm not sure how Jack spent that, but I'm guessing he needed a lot more. Luckily, I didn't have to rely on just that. Right. Obviously, there are public funds as well available. Um, but the great thing is about private funds is Jack could have spent it on what he wanted, and he could have used it to match and get more public funds. Um, in, in Britain, it was much bigger uh, media event. Um, and we can talk about the reasons why later. Glad to get your opinions. 
The Disasters and Emergency Committee raised 71 million there. We did do media, um, especially earlier on, we were getting quite a bit of media. So you can see uh, Karen Car Carolyn Finelli there on CNN. However, that's CNN International, and most of your cable stations won't pick that up. You're seeing CNN or CNN headline news. That feed goes out all around the world and is available in the US, but most cable stations don't pick it up. I mean, turning to the media, and let's be fair to the media, let's give them a break. Um, they know what people want. Slowly developing long-term disasters will be mostly ignored because they can be too emotionally draining to continue to worry about. The coverage will go down and out or, you know, they just won't be interested. Journalists and editors uh, pick the stories that they think audiences will respond to most strongly. Uh, the dramas of individual victims, so with uh, Haiti or Tsunami, you would see a news team comes along, they will show you the damage, and then it would be on to an individual person, how it's impacted them. It's, it's a familiar story. They're saying to someone like me on the ground, what's CRS doing? I will tell them, can you find me somebody who has been impacted and you've helped? Honestly, that's like the broken record. You know that's what they want. You can even start planning it before they ask you. Okay. The dramas of individual victims near or resembling audience members, um, meaning that uh, the nearer a disaster is to their audience, they want to cover it. So you had Haiti. We were completely inundated with people wanting to get to Haiti to cover it. Not just phone stuff, but they want to be there. They want to cover it. And also, they like um, disasters where the people affected look like their audience. Um, so to be blunt, Pakistan, they would have been put off because a lot of the people who were our beneficiaries looked like they might have had a Guantanamo address, to be blunt. <laughs> well, the Haitians were, you know, oh, yes, they could live down the road. That's how they make these decisions. Also, to be fair to the media, though, news organizations have budgets and priorities, and U.S. news organizations have cut back their international presence. Um, I think our friend from the U.S. military was saying that the, the U.S. Army often arrives, and they don't know much about the situation there. I think when I first started this, um, like with the Sudan emergency, you would often meet people based in Nairobi, and they would often know a lot more about the situation than you would. Now, more often, you are doing some very, very basic education with the news reporters who turn up because they've come in from New York or London and they know very little about the situation. Okay. Um, also, I should mention with Haiti and the other relationship is it, it can change very quickly from love to blame. You know, the early days of the uh, Haiti disaster, the media was all over us. Second year anniversary, they're saying it's the NGO's fault. You know, it's, it, it's changed the perception and they very much have a, a collective view. And if you hang around with them, you get them why, because they all stay in the same hotel, they all drink in the same bar, they're swapping story ideas, and the definite story for the two year anniversary was, it's the NGO's. Okay. Um, on the theme of the forgotten emergencies, uh, in conversation with some of uh, my colleagues, these are the ones that we really labeled as, they should get a lot more publicity, but they don't. Uh, Congo, right at the top. Um, the war finished quite a while ago, but it's, there's a lot of violence still going on. HIV and AIDS, you know about that, the infectious diseases, malaria, TB, dengue. Um, I mean, that affects our staff as well. Um, Maureen knows uh, Robin Fieser, who works with me. Her daughter's just come down with dengue. There's a bit of an epidemic in the DR right now. Um, Syrian refugees, I'm sure Mark mentioned that. And the Sahel food crisis, um, drought and conflict have brought on severe conditions in Niger, 
uh, northern Nigeria, Burkina Faso. And this one is completely forgotten. The Colombians uprooted. It's the third biggest displaced or refugee. Displaced means actually within their own country, but it's kind of NGO jargon. Population in the world. Um, Robin, who I mentioned, she works with me based in the DR. She told me that she'd asked a Miami Herald reporter very recently why they didn't cover that. And he said, nothing's new, nothing's changed. Okay. There was also a survey done. Um, I think I mentioned the Stanford University study. This is um, what the um, media itself says, why they didn't cover it. Um, the cost. Like I said, they've got fewer people based in Nairobi or in Hong Kong or other places closer to the emergencies. Lack of timely response by groups at the scene. That's basically saying it's my fault or Robin's fault because I wasn't on the ground and I wasn't saying come and see what CRS is doing. Um, inability to link up with relief agencies in the field. Inadequate info or jargon. And that, that's a big one that I share with them. We NGOs do go out with a lot of confusing information. It confuses me sometimes. So Lord knows what the media makes of some of the stuff we say. Um, a quick example, I'll try and be quick, is someone mentioned non-food items before. That means blankets and cooking pots and things like that. So that's what you have to tell the media. If you say non-food items, they go, yeah. Like, oh, we've got some blankets and cooking pots. They're like, well, come on, show us them then. <laughs> Um, lack of coordination between the groups at the scene and their uh, parent organization, they blame that as well. And inadequate supplementary material. And um, that's something we're try, trying to do more and more. And um, say, okay, you can't make it to Colombia, but we can get you pictures to go along with an interview. We're doing that more and more. Okay, what we won't do, and some groups are just, you know, they will push buttons that we won't push to try and get that emotional response. You know, we're a Catholic agency. We believe that human dignity is innate and should always be recognized. So we're not going to go down that route. Um, we don't believe in crying wolf with the media either. And that's another big one that they'll come back. The media will say, it's always an emergency. You're always on about this. You're always saying it's the worst one ever. So we don't cry wolf. No hyperbole. What we can't do, um, this is a picture from Liberia in 1990. And the man standing up on the right is Jacques Monteroy, who's, uh, he died in 2010, but he's a former CRS staffer. And he was captured by uh, a rebel leader there um, by the name of Prince Johnson. And he wanted to show that he needed to be taken seriously. So there was TV cameras there as well. And the unfortunate man on the ground had told Jack that nothing would happen to him, that this rebel leader was all bluster. So he handcuffed them together and assassinated the guy standing next to Jack. There are huge risks for the staff on the ground there. And sometimes we just can't talk about what we're doing. I know if Jack referenced that with Pakistan, and sometimes we can't talk about that. Somalia. We had a whole emergency in Myanmar, Burma, where the church said, respond, but don't say anything about it. And that was, that was a real tough one. Um, so at times, we just can't talk about what we're doing. And yet, we still need that media to bring the money in. Tough situation. OK, what, what can you guys do? Well, first of all, stay informed. There are some great sites out there dedicated to humanitarian emergencies. This one is AlertNet that was set up um, by Reuters. So you get lots of great news up there that won't make it onto the main Reuters news agency feed, but it will make it onto AlertNet. This is the page from yesterday. You can see that Syria is, is top there. Um, there are two other similar sites. I'd say AlertNet was the best, but ReliefWeb and Irin News, they are two UN sites that are very good, well worth looking at. And out of newspapers, 
devoted to this type of thing. I would say the development section of The Guardian, the UK newspaper, is probably about the best. Also, I mentioned we're doing more stuff. We have something called the CRS Newswire now, which is not going to ask you for money. It's not going to tell you heartwarming stories about how we help someone. It's basically the news of what we're doing. Um, we post about three times a day. When there's an emergency going on, it's obviously dominated by that. You can become advocates for what we do. You can share that through Facebook, Twitter, etc. With the fragmentation of the media, we've seen how um, groups can sort of make ripples, maybe not start a whole wave, but we can raise awareness on this type of thing. Um, everyone probably saw the Coney video. I mean, that was not driven by the news media for once. So, you know, if maybe if we'd had these things back in 2010, we could have raised more awareness about the Pakistan floods. But we've set them in place now, so, you know, please go along to the Newswire. You can sign up on the RSS feed there, and uh, it's going to give you really good information. And visit those other sites. That's pretty much it. Something we've seen a lot of lately is... Uh, proliferation of phones that can take video and people uploading all that stuff. And um, I know it's uncensored, unfiltered, but I'm wondering if in some ways you could aggregate some of that to help get the media interested in some of these things. I mean, the media should be doing aggregating and, and searching for that stuff on, on its own. But yeah. they're, it, it typically, they, again, they're smaller, they're they're, they're going to where, where some, they think there's a story. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious to know if the technological changes recently have made it, have, have given you an opportunity. It's definite opportunity, yeah. Um, you know, if we have a major emergency now, we will get more of those like small handheld things. We don't need to get a whole expensive team in to, to make video. There's also a section of the CNN website that I, I forget what it's called but they actually ask people to supply things um, exactly like that, like iPhone movies and that type of thing. And we've got stuff up on there. Not actually from emergencies yet, because it's fairly new, but it, it's opening up a whole new world, and we're not quite as dependent upon the media. We're still dependent, but slightly less so. Tom, after Alert, you named two sources, and I didn't catch them. And the, the next one that I did catch was The Guardian, but there were two in between AlertNet and The Guardian. Okay, they were. Relief Web and you and me. It's Relief Web. That's Relief Web as in spider web, all one word, dot I-N-T. And the other one is Irin News, R-I-I-N news.org both funded by the UN Thank you Tom, do you have uh, examples of how students have been engaged in uh, working with media and communications? Um, you know, probably the most effective thing was not directly on an emergency but it was the um, 100 days of prayer for Sudan I think that the student population did a really great job there. Um, you know, if we get another unpublicized emergency, or even if we launch a campaign on, you know, these chronic conditions like TB, I think it's a good opportunity to hook together new media, you know, what I was just showing, the Newswire, things like Twitter and Facebook, and students actually doing something. Um, I think some of the European aid agencies are better than that at us. I mean, CRS is, um, it's a, been a bit more conservative in its outreach to do campaigns that involve people doing things like, you know, um, this is my marathon against malaria, but we're starting to do that. And with new media, you can hook it into publicity. You can show what you're doing. So it's definitely an opportunity. 
you know, some folks in the room may be aware of a, a campaign that students here at Villanova were very involved in nationally in trying to get a petition that was going uh, <coughs> around the country. I forget how many students signed up, but to get a question on Sudan onto the um, presidential debate uh, on farm assistance. We weren't successful, but it was a, it was a great effort, and it, the students were the lead on it, and um, really took it across the country with lots of other campuses. So I think we did carry that one on the knees oh, one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, two, two I just want to follow up on the comment that you made, which struck me when you said there's very little relationship between what people give and how much help is needed. And again, thinking about some of those major disasters, and I, I think certainly one of the reasons why there was such a huge response to Haiti was, again, because of the social media. <clears throat> and I had read that there was some concern that because there was such an exponentially large response there, that that would potentially mean that money that was needed elsewhere wasn't going elsewhere. In other words, is there kind of a, a limited capacity of the world community to, you know, to give relief when needed? I think that the argument has been made that no, that that in fact is not the case, that in fact we haven't fully tapped the capacity of the world community to give. So that fear about, oh, too much money in Haiti, well, what does that mean about you know, the problems happening in the Congo? So could you just talk a little bit more about the, the potential for social media and how you're planning into the future to kind of, I mean, that response was amazing to me, and the social sure. media helped propel that over the top. I, I think most of the research I've seen doesn't back the view of um, crisis fatigue, that it, it, it touches the right buttons. So I've read some stuff that um, why, why people respond to this sort of the Haiti emergency over um, something like malaria is because it touches a certain, I mean, you're the university folks, you might know more than me, but it touches like a, the primitive part of your brain um, where you, it, you're thinking about protecting your own community while um, responding to a, a chronic problem like malaria is more of an intellectual leap. So that's why that type of funding appeals to people much more. So donor fatigue, I don't think it really exists. You had the example of Haiti, where there was massive response in, in the UK, and then they responded just as big to the Pakistan floods, less than six months later. In terms of social media, yes, we need to do more. Um, and we need to hook up with people like you and the, and the students on your campus, because it's no point in us doing social media just for ourselves. It's for you guys, it's, it's for supporters. And I like the fact that the Newswire is more about information and action and it is not necessarily about money at all. So, you know, we've, we've signed up for all this anti-social media stuff now, so please explore it. In reading the New York Times Daily, I often notice that at the scene of an emergency, they mention a relief agency. I've seen CRS, seen Save the Children, the Mercy Corps, CARE, I've seen that, and it influences me to donate to them. But at any rate, how would you rate the New York Times <coughs> for media attention in the right places? Um, it's difficult to get into the New York Times. Um, their coverage is fairly broad, but they're still a newspaper with limited resources. When they do cover something, they do a really good job. I would say the best in the US. Uh, I would say the you know, New York Times is up there. You probably have Wall Street Journal and Washington Post the next level, and everyone else is pretty much down there. They, they don't do that sort of, you know I referenced in, in the bar where they all decided that it's the NGO's fault is the two year story. The New York Times uh, man or woman would be off on their own in a corner probably talking to someone who really understood the situation. Yeah. I've got immense respect for them. So they're, they're a fantastic resource. And you know, after 9-11 and you know, looking at the whole incident with the Liberty Fund, I'm just curious with the money that comes into the big media coverage of these events, is that definitely for Catholic Relief Services used for that disaster? Absolutely. That's not the truth for every NGO. I mean, if you're giving, have a look at the small print. Because honestly, some of them will say, um, if we have, in legal language, it will say something like, if we bring in too much money, we're going to spend it on something else. 
Um, we don't do that at CRS. It will all go to it. Like, um, we brought in so much money for Japan. We had problems, and we weren't asking for the money. We had problems convincing Caritas Japan <coughs> to take it. We didn't transfer it somewhere else. Um, so you're safe on that one with CRS, but not necessarily with everyone. I think one, one more one. question, Charlie. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, the response in Britain uh, to the Pakistani uh, floods was uh, much more uh, than in, from uh, US laws. And uh, I'm guessing that this is more Pakistan than South Asians in uh, England, or maybe you can stand up there. Two reasons, I would say. The BBC was there and made a big deal of it. So it was getting into living rooms. I'm, I, I, it's my opinion, this one, and there's little research on it, but I would say that um, Americans are more likely to give to a Haiti or something in Latin America than they are to a Pakistan event. Well, Britons, because, I mean, there are Pakistan celebrities in Britain. You know, you've got your friend down the road who owns the corner shop or the Indian restaurant. If you get Imran Khan on the TV saying, respond to the floods, British people are definitely going to respond to it. So I think that would be a big part of it as well. Plus, they both love cricket, right? You know, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, before we uh, thank Tom, I just want to make a quick announcement, and that is the lunch has arrived. Uh, there's a special uh, section there for vegetarian uh, uh, sandwiches. So if anyone ordered a vegetarian, please take the vegetarian. Nobody else take the vegetarian. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, what else do I want to say? We're going to resume at 12.20, so you've got to get your lunch and sit down, and we'll move along very quickly. So please join me in thanking Tom. Tom. Tom.